Thank you to all of you for being on the call, uh, for being on our tech talk today. We really appreciate it. Uh, welcome to this. So uh, quick by way of introduction, I'm Dennis McGurk. I am the DOD Strategic Account Executive here at RTI International. Been here a little over two years, spent most of my adult life in an uh, Army uniform as an Army research psychologist, where I did a lot of work in behavioral health and did a little bit of work uh, managing wearables uh, across the DOD, medical research development world, along with uh, partners uh, across the DOD. Uh, and now's where you get the people who really know what they're talking about. So the, my, the other speakers today will be uh, Dr. Dorota Temple, and Dr. Temple is the technical lead for the DARPA Sigma Plus project. I'm doing this in order who will speak next. Um, uh, and she is also an RTI fellow, uh, distinguished career. Uh, also, you'll hear from Dr. Dave Dausch, uh, who is the lead for RTI's DARPA Sigma Plus project. And you'll hear from Megan Hegarty Craver, who is the lead in our algorithm development team. Let's jump next slide, please, Shane. So why are wearables important for the DOD? Well, I'll tell you, for each and every service, readiness is their top priority. They need to make sure that their service members are able to do their job in a multi-stressor environment in which we put them through while they're in garrison at home, while they're in the training environment, and especially while we deploy them. So there are a lot of things that are challenges. And some of the things that end up causing people to not be able to do their job, actually the majority are what we call DNBIs, disease non-battle injuries. So yes, we certainly know from the 20 years or so of OEF, OIF Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and we know from looking at over what's going on in the Ukraine right now that combat casualties are, are a major concern. But the larger numbers that keep people from being able to do their job be it at home, in training, or in a deployed environment, are these DNBIs. And we'll talk a little bit about what those are, things like respiratory illnesses, things like musculoskeletal injuries, things like psychological health or cognitive health challenges. But those are the large, largest reasons for keeping people from doing their, do their job. And what does that result in? It results in, uh, most importantly, we can't be combat effective because that's the, the military's job, right? Is to defend the nation and win wars and we have to go to war. <clears throat> and also, if you want to look at it on the, on the you know, economic side, that number there, almost 16 million limited duty days. That's a lot of people who aren't able to come in and do their job due to uh, things like those disease, non-battle injuries. And that was pre-COVID. And as we all know, back in December 2019, cases started emerging for COVID and respiratory illnesses all over. But it changed. Any of you on this uh, on this tech talk, whoever deployed, know about kind of that deployment crud that everybody gets, where you you wheeze, you don't breathe normally. So uh, respiratory has always been a challenge. And so, how do we check to see if a service member historically is able to do his or her job? We ask them. And we say, Dennis, are you OK? Dennis, can you go out on mission? Dennis, I know the other day an, explosive, an improvised explosive device went off and you lost a couple of your buddies. Are you still able to do your job? Dennis, I know you haven't slept in three nights. Can you still go do your job? Dennis, you may have been exposed to uh, some sort of respiratory threat. You, you may have, it looks like you're limping. Can you do your job? And generally, I and other service members will pro almost always tell you yes, because we do not want to let our buddies down. So self-reports are inaccurate uh, on both ways. Um, but that's also a challenge with that is if you ask what I'm doing, if you're relying on me coming in, you're not going to have a chance to intervene early. So you can't prevent an injury illness if I'm never telling you how to do it. And interestingly, a few years ago, a former Army Surgeon General, when she was a Surgeon General, said, you know, we really do know more about our trucks than we do our soldiers. However, that was a few years ago. Technology has really changed, and therefore we can know a lot about what's the check engine light on a service member. When are they going to overheat? When are they sleep deprived? When might they be having, as we're emerging, some psychological or cognitive challenges? And certainly we've discovered over the last couple of years, when might they have early symptoms of a respiratory illness to include COVID-19? Let's go to the next slide, please, Shane. So, I think uh, the easy way to say this is there are a lot of DOD organizations who are interested in as well as funding 
DOD wearable efforts. And I guess I should have said up front, wearables are something that you may have, and there are a lot of them. It could be your Apple Watch, could be your Garmin, could be your Aura Ring, could be uh, a ton of others. Whoop. You know, the device list is long. It's extensive. There are some have strengths in some areas, some have strengths in other areas, battery life, things like that. So I should have said that early on. Um, but that's what we're talking about wearables. There are also chest straps, uh, things like a Zephyr, lots of different technologies and lots of organizations who are fun in these. And as a little teaser, you'll hear about it at the end of the brief. Who's pulling all these together? Who's working to integrate all these wearable efforts? Because what I found in my career, what I've seen still now in my second career is people operating their stovepipes. And I will tell you this, my opinion, COVID really pushed that because there was a lot of CARES money and there was a lot of uh, people who wanted to get a solution. Their hearts are in the right place. Now there were some pockets of excellence where people worked together, but there were some real areas where there are challenges. We're not gonna focus on that. We're gonna focus on the rest of the talk on where did we work as part of a team under DARPA to really go after respiratory illness. So in addition to being a lot of different wearable technologies, a lot of different organizations, there's a lot of use cases. So this is the going back to that self-report. How can we make it so that we're trying to figure out and objectively measure important things that contribute to a service member's readiness to do their job up to and including combat? Because as I said, psychological health is important. There are a lot of stressors we put our service members under, including having to see their buddies die in combat. That's hard on folks. Cognitive health, as we talk about future operations in the DOD, multi-domain operations, expeditionary warfare, whatever service is calling it, sensors everywhere, tons of data. They're going to use AI, ML to really figure out that data. But still for the U.S., the key weapon system, the key system throughout is that service member. They're the ones who decide to fire. They're the ones who decide if Intel is good or not good. And that means they need to not be cognitively overloaded. They need to be able to think clearly to do their job. There's also the risk, and again, it's certainly recent headlines put a little fear into us and want us to be prepared for this. Seaburn exposure, chemical, biological, radiological, or heaven forbid, nuclear. So how could you tell if you've been exposed to one of those, be it naturally or worse, if it's been weaponized? The one we're going to spend the time, a lot of time here is our work for DARPA, again, in infectious disease, particularly respiratory illness detection, and talk about a little bit how we've been able to early do some work in detecting mild traumatic brain injury, a huge, certainly signature uh, wound of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So that sort of sets up the background of why do we do this, who's doing it, and then I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Dorota Temple to talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing and the whole Sigma Plus project. Thank you all for being on. You're up. Over. Thank you, Dennis. If we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so one of the applications of wearables that Dennis has just described to us is to provide presymptomatic warning of viral respiratory illnesses. So as as Dennis uh, explained, this is important in the context of DOD applications because it allows us to monitor the health and readiness of service members. Uh, but it is also useful in the context of Homeland Security applications, which is to protect the general public against a range of threats. So one such program that is focused on this Homeland Security application is the Sigma Plus program that we have been part of uh, for several years. Uh, the big goal of this program, which is funded by the De Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, is to develop an early warning system for a city or region for protection against a broad range of threats. So some of these threats then is just named for us, chemical, biological, radio radiological, nuclear, and explosives. The one part that we are contributing to and the one where wearable technologies are used is the one that deals with biological threats. So specifically, 
we are working on developing an automated system of wearable biosensors that can provide presymptomatic warning of these viral respiratory illnesses. Our approach is to use these physiological sensors that are worn by people as they go about their normal lives, and we monitor certain physiological metrics. These metrics are heart rate, heart rate variability, blood oxygen level, and we also monitor physical activity. Uh, these metrics then are used as inputs to machine learning algorithms that we have developed to detect early signs of these respiratory infections. And ultimately, these algorithms generate alert. These alerts can go to individual and they go to the Sigma Plus network as well. At the individual level, this alert would instruct the person to seek diagnosis and treatment and quarantine if needed. And at the Sigma Plus network level, uh, this information will be fused with information from the whole network of the human sentinels and possibly other sensors, other environmental sensors, to create a map view of the monitored area where if there are cases of infections and they start to form spots of infections, that is the indication for the local government, the law enforcement of the law enforcement and first responders to start taking actions. Let's go to slide five. <clears throat> And we'll talk about the system that allows us to collect and interpret the data. So this Sigma Plus wearable system, as we call it, was developed in collaboration with our Sigma Plus collaborators, specifically two six technologies. Uh, as you can see, this is a modular type of system, the front end are wearable sensors. Uh, we'll talk about what kind of wearable sensors we are working with in a moment. Uh, the next module is a Sync Hub, which can be a smartphone or a tablet, which runs a custom mobile application that controls the flow of the data. And then we, uh, we have a local computer, which performs data ingestion, data storage, and all the analytics that are required to process the data and generate these alerts we talked about. This computer is optional. In some cases, it might be advisable to just go directly to the Sigma Plus network. So you can see that this is a module architecture, so it allows us to arrange these different modules to meet the needs of a specific operational scenarios. And in fact, we were able at this point in the program to convert this schematic to practice and actually test operational readiness of this architecture in field exercises. And we'll, we'll show you some example of that uh, later in the talk. So one important part of this architecture is that it can be used in the field. So it can be a field system that can be operated in the situation where there is a constrained availability of resources. So, for example, you might not have internet connectivity in the field. That's why you want to have this local computer that can execute the storage and analytic node operation. So that's the first feature. The second feature is that in the operation of the Sigma Plus wearables, we do not have to transmit the data outside of the OD network. So all the data within the architecture stay within the DOD controlled network, which is of course an obvious requirement for many of the DOD and Homeland Security applications. Let's go to the next slide.
Let's talk a little about the wearables. These are our main actors on the stage. Uh, there is a broad range of wearables in the commercial market. Uh, the type of wearables that which we at RTI have had the most experience with is the Garmin Phoenix 6 family of smartwatches. Uh, these devices have already been used by US service members, so that's why we focused on them uh, in the Sigma Plus program. They are quite rugged and they have a pretty good battery life between charging. So they are good candidates for use by the service members and also in sort of general applications of the technology. Uh, these Garmin Phoenix 6 smartwatches have two sensors. One of the sensors monitors heart rate and the second sensor monitors blood oxygen level. Both of them use the same technique, photoplastomography, uh, PPG, which is based on measuring changes in volume of the blood in the blood vessels under the skin. So you can see this PPG waveform. Uh, the technique is inexpensive. It is easy to integrate it into small form factor, but it is prone to artifacts. So we are always paying close attention to artifacts and trying to eliminate them. So in this process of working with PPG devices, we find that quite often it is of value to compare the readings from these PPG devices with the gold standard. The gold standard for heart rate and heart rate variability is the electrocardiography. And there are wearable sensors based on this technique. One of these the type of sensors is Polar H10, that you can see on the picture. And we use it quite often for comparing the uh, different devices. Another sensor that I'm showing on the slide, uh, which we started to work with, is a sensor that provides the measurement of core body temperature. So this is an independent measurement uh, from a different type of sensors, which can be used in addition to, for example, smartwatch. The reason why we're interested in core body temperature is because it is one of the obvious indicators of the infection. So we would like to have this type of information available to us as well. Some of the wearables provide the measurement of skin temperature. So this is a little different. It really uh, uh, cal calculates the core body temperature. It is a device based on piezoelectric the type of mechanisms. And the third illustration on this slide is to just uh, indicate the various form factors that we see among uh, wearables available in the commercial marketplace. You can see the rings. Uh, you see a variety also of patches, which can uh, be, which can adhere to the skin, and you can wear them. Uh, wear them on your skin, monitoring your physi physiological signs. Let's go to slide seven. And I will tell you about one of the key enablers in this uh, Sigma Plus wearables architecture, which is a custom Sigma Plus health app that we have developed that uh, controls the data flow between uh, the wearables and the rest of the system. Uh, this Sigma Plus Health app is used in place of the app which comes with the Garmin watch. So if you buy a Garmin Phoenix 6 watch, it, uh, you would normally download on your smartphone an application called Garmin Connect. And this Garmin Connect uh, transfers the data from the watch, acquired from the watch, to the Garmin cloud server. So in essence, Garmin provides additional service to the user by processing the data and calculating different metrics uh, that Garmin uh, provides to the user to illustrate uh, how the 
physiology of the individual and of life in a given time period. So all of this is quite useful and of course it allows us and allows a lot of people to use these devices to, for example, monitor their exercise routines. However, if you want to use these uh, devices more in the, the DOD context, then of course you would like to limit the exposure of the data to non-DOD servers. So that's one reason why we developed this application is based on a software development kit that Garmin provided to us. The second reason is that we need for the algorithms that we developed for the early illness detection to calculate not just average heart rate, which is what Garmin Connect uh, provides, but also a range of metrics which are called heart rate variability metrics. And in order to calculate those, you need to have each interbit interval. So in order for us to get this each interbit interval with mean second accuracy, we are using our custom app. These are the two main features. Some other features that are of importance to especially research studies and Sigma Plus context is first the, the ability to link symptom surveys with, in research studies you often ask participants for providing information, self-report uh, the uh, symptoms, for example, and they may provide some additional contextual information, like I didn't sleep well, or things of this nature. And the, uh, another feature is that the app, in the context of Sigma Plus, can also collect, of course, geolocation of the sensor. Geolocation is important because ultimately at the Sigma Plus network level, we want to be able to create maps of a region where you would have the visualization of where uh, the infection, uh, infection events may be happening. So with that, I will stop and I will ask Megan Hegarty Kraber to continue and tell us how the data are processed and how we extract this actionable information pertaining to respiratory illness. Okay, if we could go to the next slide. So I'm just going to trace through kind of where all the data is coming from that we're using in our algorithms. Um, as we've talked about, we use the Garmin uh, series smartwatches a lot, specifically the Garmin Phoenix 6. They have onboard accelerometers, heart rate monitors, and pulse oximeters. Garmin does apply some in-house like custom processing techniques to extract steps from the accelerometer, um, the interbeat interval, as well as the respiration rate from the heart rate monitor, and uh, SpO2 from the pulse oximeter. So these all get stored in watch, all like on the watch, and then as a connection is available to a sync hub, we can stream it um, using a Bluetooth low energy. So what we get access to through the Sigma Plus app is a step count. We get it every minute and it's in units of steps a minute. We get respiration rate and SpO2 also on the minute. And we get the interbeat interval, which is the time between each heart rate, so kind of the inverse of heart rate. We get that with each beat. And so Dorota had said, like, this is what we really need to calculate heart rate variability metrics. A lot of wearables do calculate some flavor of heart rate variability metrics. They'll call it stress. Sometimes they call it HRV. Um, a lot of times these are time domain parameters. There are, I don't know, probably 30 some measures that you can use for heart rate variability. So being able to calculate um, oh, our own metrics over a time window that we choose is really important for um, some applications. So if we go to the next slide. They were saying, so access to these high fidelity metrics allows us to apply our own processing techniques and apply the and get the metrics that we're really interested in. Um, you can imagine the number of use cases that these can be applied for. So at the core, we have those the on watch metrics, 
if we go out one level, we apply our data processing kind of machine learning algorithms and feature extraction, and we can we can apply this process to to monitor any of the the um, events on the outer wheel. So we can look for illness, which is the one that we've done most frequently. Um, we can use these to apply or we can apply these metrics to look for thermal strain. We actually um, use the Eucerium algorithm, which can calculate um, core. It estimates core body temperature for minute level heart rate data. So we we use that algorithm um, and we were able to incorporate it into our AI ML backbone. Um, and by using our own by pro by calculating these all ourselves, we're able to be device agnostic because as long as we have access to the IBI data, we can apply that to any any sort of sensor that is pro providing that data. Um, if we go to the next slide. So kind of what does this process look like for us from the watch? We're getting, you know, several different streams on several different time frames. We can also process other sensor streams that might be on different time frames. So we need to get them to one kind of central central time. Um, we process everything as five minute epics for right now, just because that's what's frequently used in heart rate variability analysis. We can change that. Um, to be more daily values, um, but we take our raw data, we put it through a series of uh, QA, QC procedures and apply signal processing techniques to extract measures of activity from the step count um, and measures of both like average heart rate as well as um, time and frequency domain measures of heart rate variability. We QC those metrics before adding them to a baseline buffer. And then this baseline buffer is used to compare our current data to our, our previous or like baseline healthy data so we can begin to standardize metrics so that we can correct for both activity as well as between person differences. Those um, after some smoothing are what feed our illness detection model and so we can apply different methods of smoothing to highlight different features. Our illness detection model is clearly looking for a longer term change, so we can apply a little bit more smoothing. But if we were looking for a shorter term change, um, there'd be less smoothing. Then after after it gets processed through the algorithm, we're able to visualize the results. We also visualize the results of each of the metrics along the way to see exactly what could be driving an anomaly. Um, if we go to the next slide, we applied this um, to data that we got from a flu challenge study. So this flu challenge study was conducted under the Sigma Plus program. There were 20 individuals total. They were all inoculated with the flu virus. 17 of them went on to test positive, and so three were negative the whole time. We monitored for a week before. Um, then they entered the clinic the day before they were inoculated and stayed in the clinic for the next 10 days. This was a really unique study because it allowed us to like know exactly when they were testing or when they had been exposed as opposed to just relying off of symptom surveys and then like a, a diagnostic test which is administered sometime after exposure. So we have a very precise like you were exposed at this time measurement um, and using the process described on the previous slide, we were able to detect 16 out of 17 positive individuals with no false positives. Um, and we considered the healthy week for all 20 people, as well as the clinic week for the three negative people to be the, what could be, uh, what would be a false positive. Um, and so we we missed we didn't detect one person. We detected most before the onset of symptoms and some people who didn't even go on to develop symptoms. Um, we did notice that there is an elevation in the score where like the people who are more symptomatic have higher scores, but also asymptomatic, which you can see as like that kind of goldish trace in the graph. Um, they still exceed our threshold, while the green trace, which is a negative person, does not. 
So um, we are very encouraged by this, especially the since the flu virus has a, a pretty short period before people begin to develop symptoms that that we are able to detect it before symptoms um, and in asymptomatic people. Clearly, clearly this has implications for the um, COVID-19 pandemic. I see someone with their hand up. Do we want to hold questions or should I keep going? Yeah, Megan, keep going. Whoever you have your hand up, we'll call on you when we get to the end, but we want to get through everything so people can hear it. And you might get your answer. You just don't know. Okay. So we'll hold that. Thanks, Megan. Okay. If we go to the next slide, we're actually going to switch gears a little bit. Um, we've applied a similar process to look um, for indicators of mild traumatic brain injury. Um, we used a wearable ECG sensor in a study where we compared like 30 people who had recently experienced a mild traumatic brain injury with 30 con uh, controls. They performed two posture change tests and we extracted heart rate and heart rate variability features during, during like before, during, and after the posture change test. And using um, machine learning, we were able to, to achieve um, pretty good pretty good sensitivity and specificity um, for diagnosing or detecting um, subacute injuries within that 72 hour time frame. We did publish a paper, which is um, that color box in the, in the upper corner of the slide. We have also worked to transition this method into like more of an app based um, kind of use case and we use the Polar H10 with this instead of um, the ECG sensor that we used logs versus streams data. So we're really trying to make this more user friendly and able to be applied in the field. Um, we are still trying to further this research. We're looking for partners um, for people with access to cohorts of people with mild traumatic brain injury. Essentially, that's our it's always our sticking point for um, progressing this technology. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Dave Dowse to talk more about some of our other field studies. Great, thank you, Megan. So, um, yeah, this slide. So we are um, working on our Sigma Plus program and working to demonstrate this wearables collect data collection and analytics methodology that we've demonstrated through um, our development work in real world scenarios, uh, which would include real world noise, interference, et cetera, and capture um, data during periods of typical activity that you would expect during daily life. So whereas a lot of previous work has been more clinical settings, now we're deploying smartwatches on individuals and collecting real world data and optimizing our algorithms for illness detection or other health um, anomalies, um, you know, within a real world, within real world scenarios. So the ultimate objective of the work on Sigma Plus is to integrate this human, what we call this human sentinel capability, including the wearables data and detection algorithms to provide alerts of human response to sea burn threats. And so an example of the data that we would that we are collecting um, through this platform would be on the on the graph on the lower right side of the screen where we are um, collecting various physiological metrics, calculating various heart rate variability metrics, as Megan described. And then the resulting output is from the algorithm, the Sigma Plus algorithm that shows the Sigma Plus risk score in the green curve at the bottom of that graph um, that would indicate uh, a, a person's uh, either healthy baseline or departure from a healthy baseline. In this case, you see a spike in Sigma Plus score because there is a, a potential alert of a potential infection in this particular participant. So these alerts would then uh, be used uh, to indicate that an individual should potentially, you know, could be infected and should potentially get tested or quarantined as appropriate. Um, this data then is then aggregated into a system called Detect, which is a custom sensor data integration and visualization platform that was developed uh, for the Sigma program by our collaborators at 2.6 Technologies. And this um, basically collects uh, data from various sensors, including wearables, as well as other chemical and biological sensors and radiological sensors that are being used by the Sigma program. All of this sensor information then feeds into a higher level algorithm for detecting and localizing biological, chemolo chemical or radiological uh, releases or outbreaks. Um, to provide actionable information to first responders and to public health officials. So we're currently running 
uh, a pilot evaluation of the Sigma Plus wearables uh, capability with stakeholders on the, in the program. Um, this is our first evaluation of a longer term real time data collection activity from smartwatches uh, in real world scenarios. So we have 40 participants who we are collecting data from over an eight week period. We're using this information to evaluate and optimize our data collection architecture, the data quality, and also to continue refining our algorithms. And then this will lead into a into a Sigma Plus uh, uh, network field demonstration in the final year of the program in this coming upcoming fiscal year um, to uh, demonstrate the capabilities of the Sigma Plus network, uh, including these illness detection algorithms. So if we go to the next slide. We've also uh, worked with other DOD stakeholders, um, and particularly we've worked a lot with JPEO, CBER, and D, and, uh, and working on uh, doing some demonstrations in a military context with, DOD, with other DOD stakeholders. Um, we have um, uh, worked with 2.6, as Dorota mentioned, to develop a hardware and software architecture for local data collection analytics that requires or that can be operated with no internet connectivity. And we've demonstrated this um, capability with um, in a couple of exercises uh, for the DOD. So this is basically a secure closed loop, sy closed loop system that provides a tool for situational awareness in either garrison or tactical settings. Um, we've also worked with um, our partner MRI Global to uh, to add a wearables um, uh, a wearables plugin for the ATAC visualization platform, and so this kind of this lower right uh, graphic again shows um, a display of the types of metrics that we can display on ATAC for different wearables users, and then includes the Sigma Plus uh, algorithm for detecting illness, and this just kind of shows a a mock up of what the Sigma Plus score would look like. Um, in a scenario where there's green, you know, a green very low number for a healthy individual or yellow or red indicators or alerts for individuals that either could be infected with an illness or could be infected or or exposed to a chemical um, or biological or radiological threat or be um, under a condition where they're undergoing extreme fatigue uh, due to the exercises that they're under that they're undergoing. Um, so this just gives a sense of what this looks like in the in a military uh, scenario that and working uh, to do this on multiple exercises. So if you go to the, the next slide. So just to give a summary of the key features of the Sigma Plus Health platform. So basically this um, provides a secure high resolution data collection platform uh, for looking at uh, raw data from these wearable sensors uh, from best in class sensors in real time. Um, as Megan and Dorota mentioned, this is high resolution data that's streamed independently of the vendor cloud. So we, are, we have the ability to um, develop our own algorithms that are specific to the applications that we're looking that we're looking for. And it also provides a tool for algorithm developers to be able to access data that has not been run through other algorithms that you are unsure of what the outputs are. So you can you know, sort of take this raw data and develop your own algorithms. It's a um, it, we also have developed highly sensitive and predictive analytics, and uh, we have models again that are independent of vendor algorithms. We have metrics um, that are standardized to activity level and they're based on both daytime and nighttime data. Um, so this is very important for sort of the real world scenarios and understanding what happens uh, not just when people are sleeping, but what they're exposed to during the course of a day. Um, and then the output again is the Sigma Plus health risk score, which then will alert every hour and, it, and an elevation in that risk score would indicate a deviation from an individual's healthy baseline. So that action can be taken. So we believe that this is an innovative operational um, and decision support capability uh, for both military and public health uh, and Homeland Security applications. And it provides actionable information about the health status of individuals or warfighters or whatever the scenario may be. So that's all I had. I'll turn it back over to Dennis to wrap us up. Yeah, Shane, if you can go to the next slide, please. So just I kind of teased this at the very beginning. You saw a lot of different organizations, a lot of different uh, end users. Then you heard some really sound science and some sound application of that science with just described of the Sigma Plus work. Uh, and, and again, I think I go back to, well, how is this important? Why is it important? The DOD certainly recognizes, again, that key system is the human, and they need to improve the health and the performance. Uh, the, the other folks, as we see in the news, and certainly you hear about enough with China, are really trying to improve their service members, and that's a threat to the whole nation. Um, and so uh, we're part of, hopefully, a solution. So uh, we, 
as Megan, we're looking for partners. So one of the things we did is because in North Carolina, we have really strong academia. We have really strong industry. We have Fort Bragg, which is the center of the Army universe. There's almost no soldier that can't be touched by one of the commands on Fort Bragg, Forces Command, USASOC, uh, 18th Airborne Corps, 82nd Airborne, Army Reserve Command, all located headquartered there. So that's a key thing. Not too far down the road, we have Camp Lejeune. Right up the road, we have Norfolk for the Navy. Uh, so we're covering Wilson Seymour Johnson. Sorry, I didn't mean to leave, leave the Air Force out. Uh, so we decided to try to get everybody working together. So we developed this coalition of willing, more than 40 uh, academic industry and DOD partners all working together, trying to row in the same direction. So we don't have the stovepipes that happen both in the DOD and out here in the research and development world. Relatively new effort, kickoff in September. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get a little funding put in the DOD budget that we're working to get uh, brought down to us and the team down here. Um, and what we're really trying to do is be able to provide a more objective measure. Now, Dave, Dorota, Megan all alluded to it. It's first you want to know something's wrong, right? So uh, is it we could then figure out, was it overheating? Was it sleep deprivation? Was it I was slimed with a chem biological agent? Um, so we want to know these things. We have an objective measure so you can intervene. You can get out of that area. You can intervene on an individual and get them checked out on all these kind of things. So we're working together. I think we bring three value propositions to the DOD, connective tissue. We're bringing together anybody who wants to be part of the team and is willing to sign an NDA to collect uh, to protect uh, intellectual property and share a quad so we can team you up. We also provide continuity. Uh, DOD leaders rotate every two to three years. They're not really always sure what studies, what was going on in their units. They certainly aren't likely to be there if a five-year project goes through. So we're able to do that and help them see what's been tried before, what is successful, what failed. Um, and then the last thing is the capabilities. And that's why hopefully some of you were thinking, boy, uh, I have a capability. I'd like to know how do I work with a DOD better or how do I work with partners who bring something to the game? And I think you heard that from our three outstanding scientists. Um, and that wraps it up, Shane. Let's go to the most important slide. And I think I wanted, was hoping we'd have at least 15 minutes, and we do. So this is the time for discussion. You could either, if you're, you know, don't want to say it, put it in the chat, and I'll read it out loud in a very loud, gravelly voice. Um, or, uh, Shane, we could bring people off mute, right, to go ahead and ask their question, either, uh, you know, with a video or not. I know I have a radio face, so uh, I did both. It's up to you if you want to do that. I see a hand up. Um, Shane, you're able to identify who that is. It looks like Pete McGuire. Can you unmute him for us, Shane? Yep, we just uh, enabled his microphone and uh, camera. So, Peter, please go ahead. Peter, your hand is still up and you should be unmuted. Or you could unmute yourself. You just got to click your on that because it shows you're still muted. Hmm. Maybe if you just want to type your question in the chat, that might be the easiest. There we go. Now I, you guys made me presenter and it worked out. Um, so hi, I'm Peter McGuire. I, I had a question, two, two questions um, throughout the talk. So going back to, this is when Megan was talking about the flu um, study. So how large was your cohort? Because 17 positive cases isn't that large. So I'm just wondering how big was your, your overall population? 20. We had 20, 20 total okay. people. Oh, so you had 20 people being monitored in the entire cohort and 17 of them got COVID. Got flu, yes. Or sorry, flu, not COVID, yeah, sorry. That's flu. Right. Yes, um, it was actually interesting. We started this work before COVID um, and mm -hmm. then COVID took a different turn. So um, yeah. yes, the purpose of that study was kind of mostly to determine what features in heart rate and heart rate variability we really wanted to focus on, as well as like which directions the signal should go when people are sick relative to, like I said, knowing, the, knowing exactly when they were inoculated versus just simply trying to go off of symptoms and work it back that way. 
Yeah, what features did you guys identify were the most important? Um, we had, we I think we whittled it down to like two heart rate variability features um, mm -hmm. and a heart rate feature, keeping in mind that they were activity standardized. So activity does play a role in that. Um, we didn't, we only had a, a wearable ECG sensor. So there's only so much that we could extract from it. There was another monitor that was included um, that was meant to monitor more, but had a lot of like, like connectivity issues. Um, we, since we moved to the smartwatches, we are also able to, to get SBO2. We found that to be, you know, pretty steady during the day mm -hmm. when we do get it um, and are looking to explore more if there are changes at night that might be more telling. Gotcha. Great. Thanks. Um, second question. This was going back to when um, you guys were talking about data transfer. So you guys, your platform relies on Bluetooth data transfer. How do you handle elevated um, security levels where the Bluetooth wavelength is no longer allowed to be utilized? How does the platform deal with data because in those situations I would expect you know stress levels are higher you know tensions are higher and command needs to see what's happening on the ground with soldiers how do you address that complication and have have you looked at that yet we have not we have the data like we are able to log a lot of data on the Garmin smartwatch so some of our due to like COVID complications were like we sent the watches into the field and then post process the day which clearly isn't like great for real time indicators but we have not worked with in a situation yet where we could not use Bluetooth because I think the only thing on the watch is Bluetooth um mm -hmm. so yeah, make yes, we do thing. realize that that is that, that is a concern. Um, but yeah. I was thinking that one of our exercises included um, soldiers who you know were in a mounted uh, platform and then dismounted, and so basically in those cases they would dismount for a short period of time and then come back to the to the vehicle, and basically they would just you know log their watches while they were dismounted, and then once they were back to the vehicle they could Bluetooth in and and their data would be uploaded and a lot of stuff. Gotcha. Okay. I guess in. Another important thing to point out, we do not get GPS location from the watch itself. So in no, that is never transmitted over uh, BLE. The, when we would be extracting GPS, it would be from um, the sync hub, essentially. Gotcha, okay, that's better. Great, thanks and, so much. And I, I see we have in the chat a couple of questions. One of them is from the esteemed Dr. Kurt West. Kurt, good to have you on here. Uh, hope you're well. Uh, his question was, is your data given any insight to the sleep quality and our soldiers wearing our devices 24 seven or only during working hours? We that we are asking them to wear them 24 seven. Um, the we do get a little like we can see how active people were at night just based off the step count. Um, we are working to build out our kind of sleep quality metrics um, from the data we have available. I know that um, each of the the wearables themselves have put a lot of effort into developing sleep algorithms and everyone's algorithm is a little bit different. So um, we're looking at, yeah, how, how much does your heart rate recover during sleep? Is your heart rate variability um, doing what it should do or are the is your whatever it is I forget which one sympathetic drive down or whichever one it's supposed to be um so we are able to to look at um, measures of heart rate variability as well as heart rate recovery and and we're working on that <laughs> it's it's a it's a work in progress <laughs> Yeah, and Kurt, as you're well tracked, and other folks are doing that, we've talked to Rachel Mark Wald out at an HRC and folks about some of the sleep stuff. So there, there's some others who, yeah, we're aware of. Uh, next question comes from Sophia Chu. Is there a way to incorporate data about diagnoses to improve the performance of detection algorithms going forward? I can answer the question. Um, and uh, I would say that this is the situation that we would like to see as often as possible, meaning we would like to get 
data sets that come with a label. So ultimately, in the flu challenge study, which was our sort of foundational study for the algorithmic development, we had the ability to accurately label the data that we are analyzing. So we knew who was sick and when they became sick and who was, who was not infected. Uh, so yes, the diagnosis, especially a lab, uh, a good quality PCR test, multiplex tests if possible, is what we would like to see to further develop the algorithm. Sometime, and you can see it in the studies reported in the literature, all we have is the symptoms data. And we do with it what we can. Sometimes the data are convincing, especially if somebody is really sick. Uh, but in many cases, this kind of data have limited value because, the, as we all know, many respiratory infections, true infections, are asymptomatic. I read a paper the other day, which was published recently, which had uh, uh, meta-analysis of studies which, uh, which looked at asymptomatic uh, infections uh, in the COVID-19 pandemics, and the study concluded that about 30% of people infected with COVID were totally asymptomatic. So we need to keep this in mind as we look at what looks like a healthy data set. Uh, but ideally, that's what we want. We want uh, lab-based confirmation that the data set comes from either a healthy person or a sick person. So uh, we had two follow-up questions from Dr. West. One being, do any of the wearables use, we use incorporate electrodermal activity? And did that add any useful information? And a, I think a yes-no one, have we looked at nightmares? Because I already think the, I know the answer to that one. But... Do you uh, want to take both of those, any of you, please, over? Sure. Um, the wearables we are currently using do not incorporate electrodermal activity, although I think it would be like an interesting sensor to look at, especially for cognitive fatigue. Um, I know, I think Empatica has a sensor for EDA, maybe one of the Fitbits do. The issue for us is gaining access to the higher resolution data as well as being able to operate in a closed network. So not going to the commercial cloud, which most vendors are not willing to let you do. Um, I saw also someone had asked about the Aura Ring. We have looked at the Aura Ring. We are not currently using it in any of our studies, again, because they do want you to go through the their cloud. It does add another sensor, which is a skin temperature sensor. Um, so, it's another another dimension of data um, that's separate from heart rate and heart rate variability. So again, like exploring electrodermal activity, I think it would be it would be interesting yeah. from a research perspective. Yeah, Kurt, and some of our NC Comp partners, one of them is the NSF funded Assist Center that's out of NC State University, and they're doing some stuff with electrodermal and self uh, energy harvesting for wearables. So it, it, I, I could certainly D McGurk at rti.org, link you up with those folks. I'm sorry, I skipped one of the early questions. Sorry, Rod Saunders. GPS functions for smartwatches, apps, et cetera, can potentially create electronic signals that disclose location service. All right, I guess we already had that a little. We answered that, didn't we? Um, there are methods to do it so you don't use Bluetooth or give away signals. Um, certainly, it's important to the DOD. Any other additions to that? Uh, Megan, Dave, Dorota? Yeah, it's probably a bit outside the scope of what we're working on. Um, so, yeah. I would add. Uh, I would add to it that uh, the broad community that is engaged across the OD in the wearables research has specific efforts that we don't participate in directly, but we are sort of observers and participate in the working meetings that address specifically the issue of security. So there are groups working on these type of questions very directly. And of course, we 
We hope that we, the community overall, including us, will benefit from, from these solutions. Yep, we have another question from Cindy Crump. Hi, Cindy. Most other artifacts differ from sensor to sensor, so we've, have we been able to quantify or isolate this type of error variation? Um, she adds that it could, these differences could be of value in future research for context or cues on what the human's doing. And does the signal processing attempt to null out or control for artifacts on a per sensor basis or in post processing? Over. We do apply different like QA, QC techniques to the, the sensor streams because yes, like the, the chest strap will have a different a different problem than the wrist sensor will. So the artifact will look a lot different. So we do apply different like error checking techniques. We haven't attempted to like use the number of artifacts to do anything other than say, we're not gonna use this five minute interval because it appears to be too noisy. Um, so yes, yeah, so it would be interesting to see like, if you're seeing a lot of um, artifacts in this in a wrist like in a signal at the wrist and you don't see like a high step count clearly they're doing something like where they're moving their hands around probably talking with their hands like I tend to do um, but like they're moving their hands around um, and also does like when you're seeing a lot of artifacts from the uh, heart rate sensor are you also seeing those artifacts in the SpO2 and other sensors so I do think that would be an interesting an interesting way of doing some type of activity classification. Um, but yes, we do we do pull out the artifacts or we do pull out things that we consider artifacts. And if there are too many in a five minute window, we just don't use the window because like, although I hate losing data in theory, they're supposed to be wearing it continuously. So one five minute window shouldn't make or break our system. But yes, I, I've also worked in applications where one five minute window would make or break your your algorithm <laughs> on a related note there was a question of how is the five minute epoch duration impacting the sleep data from the garmin and aura ring and also why both devices and uh the person apologizes if the second question was answered over um we can go smaller than the five minute epic so for the um the which we call the Ethereum algorithm we are processing on a minute um the five minutes was just kind of to downsize the data to something that could be stored more manageably from the raw data but we could do overlapping windows we could for some type of sleep detection algorithm start looking at the minute by minute changes um of different things to Rhoda okay. and dave i don't know if you have anything else i would also say that five minute epoch is standard in interpreting heart rate and heart rate variability so there is a lot of medical in the literature on these metrics from clinical settings. So it gives us a comparison, right? We can see if the metrics that we are calculating are in line with what you would expect for this, for this type of windows. All right, I think Shane, we're uh, at the two o'clock hour. And so uh, I think we're gonna wanna wrap it up. Really do appreciate everybody. If you had a question, please, Put it in the chat. We will certainly uh, then answer back to you if you give us your uh, email contact. Uh, thank you very much all for for being on this tech talk. We really enjoyed having you here, uh, and uh, thank you very much.